Karen Russell is a clinical associate professor at the University of Melbourne and James Cook University and director of sexual health, can sexual health services, CANS Queensland. Um, so um, thanks, Darren, for being available. We know your time is very valuable. Um, the Treatment Officers Network, which NAPA manages, has had a couple of meetings prior to this one, and, and these were a series of questions that have been developed. So um, perhaps uh, we're, we're trying to structure it, but also allow some kind of informal discussion uh, as later. Um, what if I just put those questions to you and you give us a bit of an idea about what your thinking is? Is that okay? Hi, John. Yep, yep, that'd be great. More than happy to do a Q&A type of thing. All right, then. Thanks, Darren. Um, Darren, can you give us some of your thinking on the COVID-19 tracking app and people living with HIV? For example, what, what might be the public health concerns, benefits versus privacy concerns that might arise? Yeah. It, it's certainly interesting. There's been, I just read before, 2.8 million downloads so far. So quite phenomenal take up. The government was expecting it would take five days to get a million downloads and it took five hours. So it's certainly been taken up well after the first three days, which, which is good. Just to explain what it is, if, if anyone isn't entirely sure of, of what, uh, what the app is about, um, it is to be used with public health. Um, it basically uh, downloads onto your phone and then you get a digital uh, handshake. If you are within uh, one and a half meters of another phone um, for a period of time, say 15 minutes or more uh, during the week. So it, it just registers that you've been in contact with someone else. That data is stored on your phone. If the other person has an outbreak or sorry if you have a, um, a found to have COVID you are then uh, contacted by state or territory officials and they ask your permission to upload your own data onto uh, a central database um, so all the data at the moment is stored on your phone it doesn't go anywhere until you give permission for that to happen um, once that happens, then they can see who else has been uh, close to you and can initiate contact tracing. Three things it won't do. It's not a tracker, a geo tracker. It can't say where you are. It can only say when you are uh, and who you might have been close to. So it, it can't uh, follow you around or track your movements. The second thing is it can't get you into trouble in a legal sense um, because of the privacy safeguards built in. It's specifically um, the data from there is not allowed to be used in any way uh, in a court of law and it can't be subpoenaed or um, taken by um, uh, state or territory or federal police or, or other agencies. So it, it can't get you into legal trouble. And the third thing it can't do, just to point out, is it can't really protect you uh, by carrying it. You, you're not immune to COVID-19 or something <laughs> like that, I think. You know that needs that message needs to get out to people as well. It, it's really just who you've come in contact with. So the privacy concerns um, have been um, discussed a lot. Um, I think most agencies are pretty comfortable with what's been put in place. Some people still have some concerns, but uh, it's hard to find um, any way that this could be used against a person. There may be some concerns that because it uses Bluetooth, that that's not the most um, secure or safe uh, way. Uh, and so it could be open to hacking or something like that. That seems to be the main issue at the moment, rather than um, getting you into trouble. So um, if you uh, have been out and about with a group of 20 other guys having sex together and uh, someone in that group has COVID-19, uh, and you're all contacted because you downloaded the app, it can't be used to fine you or, or anything like that. It's not allowed to be used in that way. Likewise, if you um, uh, have your regular uh, ice dealer uh, that you go to see and uh, it pings him or her as having been close to you, you can't get into trouble. They can't get into trouble in a legal sense for that. Although if you were really worried, you wouldn't take your phone with you to your ice dealer or you'd switch off the, the app or your Bluetooth um, before you went there. 
Um, the data is only stored for 21 days once you've uploaded it. It's your choice whether you upload it. Once you do, 21 days and then it's, it's gone. So it, it doesn't hang around forever either. So that, I, I think, you know, it, it will be helpful. It will enable quicker contact tracing and it will enable uh, more people to uh, get back to their workplace and to ease the restrictions quicker if, if it's in place. But 2.8 million downloads so far, we're looking pretty good at, at um, being able to use it in a public health sense. Mm. Okay. Um, thanks, Darren. There's a couple of questions occur. I, I, I'll ask um, people either to uh, write them down on the um, chat or um, give me a very clear signal. But I can see a clear signal from Tico. So, Tico, did you want to just check something there? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Darren. Hi, it's good to see you Hi, again. Yeah. Um, the, the questions that I want to ask is that, do you see, particularly for your own clinic, that the app will be used as part of a workplace health and safety procedure? And do you also see other organizations such as, you know, organizations that have, you know, high number of um, staff working in a close environment like manufacturing, for, for example, to, to basically uh, will use this as part of the mandatory uh, uh, OHNA? That's a really interesting question. It's not one I'd thought of at all until yesterday when I discovered that the Queensland Ambulance Service has mandated that it must be downloaded uh, onto all of their work phones. So the AMBOs uh, have, have it so that, um, again, they can um, use it in that sense to uh, isolate people or get people tested if they've been at risk. So it's not one I'd thought of before, but I could see that in some workplaces, particularly in the health field, it, it would be important that on work phones people did it. I don't think they could mandate that you do it on your own phone. Uh, but, but certainly work phones are, are, could happen. I don't know if anyone's heard of it happening anywhere else. I heard that happening anywhere else, but I can hear a dog barking in the back. <laughs> that's, 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 my, that's my dog, Pawpaw. Sorry about that. I'm good. at home. So it's, good, it's, good, it's good to meet Pawpaw. And <laughs> there were a couple of other uh, questions um, that came through, Darren, which maybe we can put back a bit later. I mean, one is, is it possible that um, some of those protection laws might change further down the line? Um, and the other is, uh, who is it that's going to ask you permission to access your information? So... I'll take the second one first. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, who is it? It would be the state and territory contact tracers. Um, so the public health teams in states and territories. The federal government has no access to the data. It cannot access it. Uh, the data goes to the state and territory. Um, so in my case in Queensland, um, if uh, I'm diagnosed with it, someone will ring me up and will ask, um, can we upload your data? Um, so it'll be someone from Brisbane or Cairns or Townsville um, in the public health team. Can we upload your data? And if I say no, go away, then they can't do it. If I say yes, then they can. And um, they then see who I've been in close contact with who also has had the app turned on. Uh, the second, the first question, that's um, one I, I can't answer. I'm certainly not an expert in that field. Yeah. Could, yeah. could uh, protections or things change in the future? I suppose they could one way or the other. More protections, less protections. But uh, given the concerns about this app, I'm not sure that the government would willingly start changing things unless there was a very good reason to do it. And then if people didn't like it, they just switch off the app, switch off Bluetooth. Okay, um, thanks Darren. Um, that's really uh, certainly helpful information for me uh, and clarifying a few questions I had in my mind about that. Um, the, the second uh, one again was I guess uh, around the kind of technologies that we're all um, facing. Could could you tell us a bit about what's working from uh, your perspective, uh, the clinical perspective on telehealth um, and uh, what's working, what's not? But also um, because we are getting uh, some reports in that people are appreciating the availability of telehealth, whether these things now having been put into place, some might be able to be continued into the future. What COVID's really done is make us 
think outside the square and, and think of the way we do things um, in a very rapid way. Usually these changes take a long time. Like how often should you go and see your clinician and have your blood test done if you're HIV positive? But well, to three months, six months, 12 months, we debate this. With COVID now we're having to push the debate a bit further and, and really think what do we need to do as opposed to what might we like to do. So we've always used telehealth a bit, especially being in Cairns. We look after Cape York and the Torres Strait all the way up to uh, Papua New Guinea. So uh, those distances are so huge. During the wet season, people can't fly, can't drive. Um, so we've always utilised it to some extent. What we've done now is to use it a lot more. Um, many people, of course, don't want it to come into our clinic um, during this, this era of COVID. And so we're trying to be as flexible as we can with Zoom, Skype, um, Facebook, Messenger, uh, all sorts of ways. And trying to, I suppose, let the patient, the client lead the process. What would they like to do? If they want face-to-face, -face, we're still seeing them face-to-face. -face. If they would really don't want that, we're... Uh, certainly offering them telephone or, or video conferencing. And maybe 50-50 at our clinic. I don't know about other clinics around the place, um, but a lot of people are taking up the telehealth option. And for most people, it works really well. Um, and it's more convenient. It's probably a bit quicker um, with people who would have to drive a long way or catch a bus to see us. They're probably going to prefer this in the future if they can. Then we can send them out a pathology form to their home address or send one out to their phone. They can go into the local pathology provider, have their bloods done, and maybe this happens you know, once or twice a year and then we see them face to face another one or two times a year. So I think it's got real benefits going forward, but it needs to be led by the consumer, I think. It needs to be what, what the people living with HIV want from this. Interestingly, we do a lot of abortions, medical abortions at our clinic as well, and we've shifted almost totally to doing those over the phone, which we never used to do. And anecdotally, the women prefer it. Um, they don't really want to come in to see us. They get all the information over the phone, pills they can pick up at a local pharmacy, and they can then choose the time of having the abortion at home. So we may, might actually use this model going into the future because it seems to be what the person wants and is more convenient for them. So it's been a real learning curve for me. I don't know if others have experience of this as well. Um, well, thanks, Darren. I, I'm pleased to hear how positively you're talking about it as well, because um, in the kind of um, uh, discussions that we've had, uh, nearly overwhelmingly, there were a couple of um, people reported having difficulties, but the difficulties might have been more around the mechanics of it or the mechanics of the uh, meeting occurring between the, the healthcare worker and the provider. So you kind of realise that the kind of administrative level there that might kind of um, there have been a couple of hiccups. Yeah, I suppose the other part of the question was, do you see it sort of hanging around beyond this? And um, how much of what you'd normally, I mean, you're probably in a unique position Darren, because you, you use it quite probably a lot more than, you know, your average GP has done. But is it going to hang around for long, for the longer term? I suspect it will do. I'd, I'd like to see it available as an option for people longer term, certainly. Uh, it's um, really, for some people, it's, it's better um, that they can do their consult from work or home or local park or wherever they want to be. And as you say, not have to take time off and get in a car or get in a tram or train and uh, get to the clinic and find a car park and all those sort of problems, especially in the cities that you have. So I'd like to see it there as an option. Your first point though about complex things, yeah, we, we still need to see the person. I had someone with shingles last week, they rang up and was explaining it to me and I thought, gee, I wonder if that's shingles and I really asked them to come in and it was. He sort of needed to see that. The other interesting thing being a sexual health clinic is that um, now we're getting all sorts of kind of selfies and dick pics being sent to us, um, which is kind of interesting. Someone's got a discharge or a spot or a sore and getting all these rather odd looking dick pics uh, heading my way, which is a 
yeah, not a totally new experience, but a somewhat different experience, I suppose I could say. Well, slide for your PowerPoint presentation, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'll save the best ones up. <laughs> yeah, um, um, as you said, Darren, um, the idea of it being, um, you know, patient-led, if, um, if, if we're interested in this continuing, um, if it's any help, um, NAPWA has put out a survey um, and one of the uh, things that's been explored in that survey is how the telehealth is working for people. So we'd be really happy to kind of try to feed that information back to you. Yeah. Um, I, think I just want to comment briefly on the, because we raised the issue before in relation to our own meetings, confidentiality, um, like if you're sending dick pics, for example, how does that work and how reassured are people about the confidentiality of the data that's, that's transmitted and what programs and protections are in place for that? Yeah, I, this is a bit of a vexed area, I think. Um, some people have almost no concerns at all, and some people have very significant concerns, and probably for reasonable reasons. We hear, you know, of people Zoom bombing, you know, <laughs> coming in on other Zoom uh, meetings, although I believe uh, Microsoft's just put in place a patch to, to prevent that. But some platforms are much more secure than others, that's for sure. Um, and you've also got the issue of yeah, local pharmacy. Perhaps before you were using a hospital pharmacy, now you're using a local pharmacy. That can have privacy issues as well, especially in a regional area or small town. Um, and the same with the pathology lab, that your local pathology lab is taking your blood now instead of you having it done at your doctor's surgery or at the hospital or sexual health clinic. So I think they're the sort of things that'd be really interesting to hear about in the survey. Um, what people feel about those things. Is it, is it a real problem or is it not a real problem? And I, I, again, I don't have a good, good feeling, but it should be raised as an issue in the mix, I think. Uh, th thanks, Darren. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think there's a lot in what you're saying. Um, just a, a direct personal experience around um, changing um, where my um, medications are going to and what that means um, in a regional area. Um, but the other is, is there, is there anything you think that we should be thinking about uh, at the moment for the last, um, last eight minutes? Um, is, is there anything else that's kind of in your head that you'd like to... <laughs> Yeah. I think the two things are what you're doing already, which is ask the consumers, ask people living with HIV what their experiences are at the moment, good and bad, what's better about COVID, what's worse about COVID. Because going forward, I really think we clinicians can use that information to guide our practice in the future. And perhaps it's something that NAPWA can feed back, I'm sure you will, to to ASHAM for dissemination so that clinicians can get a feel for what people want. As always, I think with HIV and the care of people living with HIV, it's flexibility uh, and it's where possible having a range of options. Some people want to go to their GP for this. Some don't want to go anywhere near their GP. Some want a local pharmacy. Some do not want a local pharmacy. And where possible, we should be trying to um, take into account those concerns and give the consumer the best experience they they can. Probably the second one is something that, second issue is something that you would have dealt with already also, and that's uh, the issue of keeping a month or two of antiretrovirals in supply. You do not need six months, 12 months. Well, some of ours get six months. That's because they're stuck up on the tiny little island off the coast of Australia, somewhere near Papua New Guinea or in Papua New Guinea itself but you don't need six or 12 months, uh, but you, it would be wise to get one or two months ahead. Um, if people are isolated uh, because they've used the app and they're, um, they've been found to be in contact with someone with, with COVID and they're isolated for a couple of weeks, it's just good to have the reassurance that you've got your medication there with, um, and that it's not gonna be an issue for you. And that would be about it, trying to get that message balance that you don't need to hoard a year's worth, but neither should you wait till you, your last pill before refilling your script. Just being sensible. Um, Darren, can you just talk for a minute about uh, 
presentation issues? I mean, are, are the numbers of presentations uh, in your clinic going down? Uh, are people uh, are not having pleasure anymore? Uh, um, and are the changes in the presentations? You know, there's fewer people wanting prep and fewer people having STIs. Yeah, from, from what I hear, there's a lot of self-pleasure occurring um, <laughs> at the moment. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that seems to be the, uh, um, the current practice from what I can understand. We're certainly seeing uh, far fewer people coming in. We, we normally see about 300 people a, a week through our doors. We'd be seeing half of that now. Um, and when people come in, they're more likely to have symptoms. So they've got something wrong and they want it dealt with rather than just coming in for a checkup. PrEP, certainly. Presentations for PrEP and for PEP have dropped significantly. Um, perhaps people are getting their PrEP from somewhere else, but I suspect they're having a PrEP holiday or taking it on demand now because the opportunities for having as much sex as they were having before is, is certainly less than what it was. I get the feeling people aren't having as much sex and I also get the feeling some people are having a bit of sex, but due to peer pressure, aren't telling anyone they're having a bit of sex. So it's probably a bit of all of the above, but I do think we're, we're seeing certainly fewer people coming into the clinic. And I don't know what that means for rates of gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia. If there's less sex, do these start declining? Do the rates drop? On the other hand, most of these are asymptomatic. So if no one's being screened, no one's picking this up. So we don't know if it's there. So I think it'll be a really interesting once we can screen everyone again, as we were doing before, do STI rates go down during this time or do they go up or do they stay the same? I don't have an answer, but I'll be fascinated to see what happens. Yeah, that, that was one of the comments that just came through on the uh, chat, Darren, uh, you know, STIs, if things are lifted, you know, um, who knows what, what might happen there. And, and the other, is that maybe um, people have been abstinent and maybe tested so that there's less prevalence in the community. Absolutely. I think that's quite, quite possible. And many of these STIs disappear or become much less infectious over time. So if we're all in quarantine or lockdown for a greater period of time, some of these will just disappear by themselves. Um, but that's counterbalanced by the fact we're not diagnosing as many. And then when people are able to uh, express their love freely in the future, um, the, the rates could, uh, could climb up very rapidly. I don't know, I, fascinating to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, look, um, thanks Darren, unless there's anyone else with a particularly urgent um, question coming up, um, uh, we'll all say um, thanks. I, I, I was, um, that question you asked about what's, better about COVID at the moment and it's kind of interesting that we're just having a discussion about some things that are uh, having consequences we didn't expect. Mm. Yeah. Um, look, thanks Darren. I don't know, I've just been suggesting everyone wave as a thank you. <laughs> and, Great. Um, a, a particular wave to Paul Paul for his... Yes, thank you. Paul Paul and I, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>